Good afternoon, Kansek West. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around to the last talk. I know a lot of people have, uh, have flights and stuff to catch, so really appreciate it. Uh, I'm Mike Ryan. I'm a security consultant with ISEC Partners, and uh, I'm here to talk to you about Bluetooth. Before we get into it too far, you may have seen the terms Bluetooth Smart, Bluetooth Low Energy, and BLE. These are all the same thing. Um, BLE is not the same type of Bluetooth that you're, you would use to play music on speakers or with your Bluetooth headset or with your, with your, uh, your car controlling your phone. That's uh, classic, basic rate Bluetooth. BLE is a new part of the Bluetooth protocol that's used in situations where power consumption is a little bit more, uh, more important and where there's generally less data to be sent. So the most common use for BLE right now is fitness devices. I just saw some statistic that said 96% of BLE devices are fitness devices. The things like heart rate monitors, fitness wristbands, that sort of thing. But uh, at the moment, there are several other interesting devices out on the market. There are a couple of BLE door locks, um, and you may have heard of Coin. They're a startup that has a little BLE device that's supposed to emulate your credit card. So there's, there's a lot of cool stuff going on with, with BLE right now. So a uh, little bit of history for you. In June of 2010, the people who standardized Bluetooth, the Bluetooth SIG, published Bluetooth 4.0, and that's the first spec that defined BLE. That's the beginning of time as far as Bluetooth Smart is concerned. Uh, starting in 2010, up until about October of 2011, not a whole lot happened in this space until Apple released the iPhone 4S along with iOS 5.0. This was the first major smartphone to support BLE. Um, again, starting in 2012, there's a bit of a lull. There were a couple of device manufacturers coming out with some devices. In mid-2012, I started my previous line of research, building a BLE sniffer on Ubertooth. And I demonstrated that in uh, October of 2012 at TorCon, and kept working on that for a little while. Starting in early 2013, there was a real explosion of BLE devices. Uh, I think as of today, there are something like 30 million devices on the market that are either BLE or Bluetooth Smart Ready. Um, in February of 2013, I demonstrated a tool called Crackle. This exploited a, an already fairly well-known weakness in BLE's pairing protocol. Uh, Crackle automatically captures all the key, uh, the key exchange messages and cracks the key exchange, breaking the encryption and, and making it possible to sniff even encrypted connections. Uh, in uh, July 2013, Google came out with Android 4.3, and that was the first version of Android with universal BLE support. Prior to that, a couple of Android phone manufacturers uh, came out with devices that had BLE, but there was API fragmentation. Every manufacturer had their own API, and uh, there was already enough fragmentation in Android that just device manufacturers didn't even bother targeting them. So it wasn't really until July 2013 that Android became a viable platform for BLE. Uh, at the same time, BlackBerry 10 came out, which also has Bluetooth smart support. Uh, I don't actually know a whole lot about that platform. Finally, uh, just in December of 2013, just a few months ago, the Bluetooth SIG released Bluetooth 4.1. This uh, was a pretty major update to the Bluetooth spec. It improved the encryption and security of classic basic rate Bluetooth but it didn't actually do anything for BLE, which was kind of disappointing because they had known about weaknesses in its pairing protocol since July of 2010. And in earlier that year, I demonstrated not only is it a theoretical weakness, it's, it's practical weakness. Like you can go out and download Crackle now and crack Bluetooth conversations using it. So yeah, it was a little disappointing, but um, there should be a new version coming out that might address this, who knows. But anyway, that's the old stuff. Um, and my old work, my, my previous research was all passive. It was just monitoring Bluetooth connections without actually sending any data out. So in the work that I'm going to present today, I'm actually going to talk about BLE active attacks, transmitting data to devices, talking to devices, and some lower level attacks that involve sending some malformed data to devices. Excuse me. This is what a Bluetooth, a BLE stack looks like. You can kind of relate it to some stacks you might be more familiar with, say like a TCP IP stack. 
if I were going to draw one of those, at the top I'd have TCP, under that IP, that writing on top of Ethernet, and then at the bottom I'd have an Ethernet file. Well, in BLE, it looks like this. At the bottom layer, you've got the file layer. When a BLE device transmits, it modulates a small amount of RF. That's the file layer. Above that, you've got the link layer, which defines the packet format and uh, that sort of thing. The Ubertooth sniffer targeted those two layers. So Mike Osman, the guy who created the Ubertooth, went on to create HackRF and Daisho, and he observed that if you target a specific protocol layer uh, for sniffing or capturing, you get every layer above it for free. So although the Ubertooth sniffer only targets the file layer and the link layer, it actually passes up all the higher application layers directly to the PC. So that's very powerful, and that's one of the things that makes the Ubertooth sniffer uh, very useful. I'm going to gloss over L2CAP for right now because it's very boring in the context of BLE. There's not much there. Uh, moving up, on the top right, you've got the security manager. This is what Crackle targeted. This is what handles pairing, key exchange, and that sort of thing. But again, this was passive. There were no packets transmitted. For actually talking to BLE devices, the actual interesting part of BLE, we want to look at the left part of this diagram, GAT and AT. This is where applications live. Um, before I go any further, uh, I'll note that GAT and AT are defined as separate layers and presented as separate layers, but they're so tightly wed that I'm just going to kind of gloss over that and merge them into one. So if you hear me talk about GAT, I'm actually referring to GAT and AT. So any BLE device, any BLE application is, uh, speaks GAT. Everything is going over GAT. And it's a pretty simple protocol really, if you boil it down to its essence, you're left with characteristics. That's the, sort of the fundamental unit of GAT. And really, they're just a name-value pair with certain operations that you can perform on them. Um, and in the, if you think of like your typical sort of BLE application, you'd say like a temperature sensor or something like that. It might have a temperature characteristic. When you try to read that characteristic, you will return the value of the temperature. Pretty simple. Uh, another hypothetical application would be a BLE light bulb that you could control with an app on your phone. If you want to turn on the light, you launch the app on your phone, it connects to the light bulb, and it issues a write request to the light bulb illumination characteristic. And let's say it has a value of one for a turn on the light. That write request goes to the light bulb, and the light bulb turns on. That, that's it. That's that's a GAT characteristic for you. There are some more exotic operations, um, but this is really the basics of it. And I said it's a name value pair. Names in GAT are UUIDs, 128 bits, and in some circumstances, 16 bits. And some of the more common ones are standardized by the Bluetooth SIG, like uh, for a heart rate monitor, the heart rate characteristic has a standard UUID, or uh, a proximity sensor has a, a standard set of UUIDs. The other high-level component of GAT is services, and that's just nothing more than a group of related characteristics. And so, for example, if you've got a heart rate monitor, you'll have a heart rate service that'll have a heart rate characteristic, um, maybe a body sensor location characteristic. The temperature service will have a temperature characteristic. And then most devices also have a device information service that has things like the name of the manufacturer, um, the firmware revision, sometimes the device serial number, which is super useful for tracking people, um, things like that. If you actually want to talk to a device, you need tools that speak GAT. Because remember, our goal here is we're trying to attack BLE devices, so we obviously have to talk to them. The two tools that I make the heaviest use of are LightBlue and GAT Tool, and that's not a typo, there are three T's in GAT Tool. Uh, so Light Blue is an iOS app. It's very polished. It's very useful. Great for just doing basic recon with devices. And GAT Tool is part of the, and it's free in the App Store, so check it out if you've got an iDevice. Uh, GAT Tool is part of the Linux Bluetooth stack. Uh, it's not very well documented, but it's a very powerful tool. Uh, I use this probably more than Light Blue. And I'll, I'll give a little demonstration of that in a moment. This is what Light Blue looks like. Uh, a day or two ago, I was sitting in the audience looking around at what sort of BLE devices are out there, and I saw somebody was wearing a Nike Fuel Band. So I connected to it, and uh, Light Blue gives you this nice UI with uh, two services, the device information service and uh, another service that has a 128-bit UUID. 
That uh, UUID is a Nike specific service. Uh, if you wanted to actually talk to the, the fuel band, you'd have to connect to that and figure out what kind of protocol they're using. So I just went ahead and stuck with the device information service because it's easy to understand. So when you tap on that, remember a service is a collection of characteristics. These are the characteristics that are in the service. Manufacturer name, model number, serial number. So you can click on any of these and the phone will issue a GAT read request for the value. So if you click on manufacturer name string, you'll see in the little ASCII bubble at the top of the list there is Nike. And you could do that with serial number, number, firmware revision, any of this sort of stuff. So that's just basic recon using uh, light blue. Um, and uh, I've got another device up here. I'll just run a quick demo talking to it. This is just a, a BLE proximity sensor. I happen to know it's, uh, I already know it's Bluetooth address, so I'll just go ahead, connect directly to it. Of course, I'll type my password wrong first. Okay, so probably a little bit hard to see on the back, but I'm uh, connecting to this device right now. And you see it turn blue because I connected to it. The way you list services is you type primary, and then you get a list of services. And if you look on the uh, right-hand side of this, over here are the UUIDs of the services. You see 1800, 1803, 1802. Uh, you can find out what these services are from the uh, Bluetooth SIGs assigned number page. So we go to services, we say like uh, 1802 is the immediate alert service. Or um, let's see what 18OF is is the battery service. So if we connect it to the battery service, there's gonna be a characteristic in there with the battery level. You can also uh, connect. You can also list all the, the characteristics on the device. So here's a big list of characteristics. You've got 2A00, 2A01, 2A04, and uh, the Bluetooth SIG also has a list of all the characteristics. So uh, 2A01 is the apparent service, and, uh, or characteristic rather. And um, which one of these is the battery level? So 2A19 is the battery level, so that's right here. So if we issue a Chari UUID, you get 2A19, and that gives you uh, hex 13, which is 51. So the battery is at 51%. Oh, sorry, no, actually, ignore that. The value is at, the battery is 51% on this device. So that's, uh, that's basic communication with a device. But uh, our goal is to actually understand a device. Let's say we've got a door lock or a credit card clone. The general technique that we use to actually understand it, first and foremost, sniff it if you can. Run the official app, communicate with the device, and then use something like an Ubertooth to sniff it. Uh, there's some other commercial sniffers. Uh, Elisys, one of the sponsors of this event, sells a very nice, very robust uh, Bluetooth sniffer starting at uh, a cool $25,000. So, you know, <laughs> pocket change. Uh, so, if you don't have access to a super fancy industrial Bluetooth sniffer, uh, you might have some trouble, because Ubertooth sniffer is pretty good, but it's not perfect. So, your next option is to connect to it using GAT tool or light blue, kind of poke around at the characteristics, send some data, see if you can figure out what it does. And with a lot of devices, this is usually enough. You just connect and you'll find a, a simple read-write service, like a pedometer, you connect to it and you, uh, you can just walk around and uh, you'll see a characteristic value increase. That's probably the number of steps. But here's the rub. I mentioned that BLE's security has some problems. The device manufacturers are aware of this, so they get around the problem by implementing their own protocols over GAT, kind of using GAT as a lightweight transport protocol. And they'll have their own encryption which may be good, may be bad, but you're not really going to be able to figure that out with GAT tool or light blue. So you need to have some more interesting tools at your disposal. If you're on Android, you have the option of actually dumping the HCI using HCI dump. This means you can actually dump the communications between an app on your phone and the Bluetooth chip on the phone so you can see the, all the data that went to and from the chip. That's really, really useful. And I've used this on some devices that I can't really talk about to understand their protocol during uh, pen tests. The next step up is disassembling the app. If you're on Android, this is actually pretty easy. You just get obfuscated Java, and it's typically pretty easy to figure out what's going on there. Uh, on iOS, it's a little bit harder because 
you have to, it's in Objective-C, so you got to load up IDA, and, and uh, Objective-C is a little tricky to use there, but it's, it's possible, and I'll show some examples of what I found from that in a second. And the last and probably most interesting thing you can do is clone a device. So first, we'll talk about who's in the app. Uh, I loaded up an app, an iOS app, in IDA, and I redacted some stuff because I don't want to pick on anybody. But these are the key strings that I found in the app. The first string is the first part of a 128-bit UUID. And uh, the, the second string, uh, OX979, is the actual, the last 16 bits of the UUID. On this particular device, I connected to it using GAT tool, and I found three characteristics. The first one ended in 979, the second one ended in 989, and the last one ended in 999. I could kind of guess as to what they were for, but it wasn't really clear just from looking at it with these long UUIDs. But when I looked in the, the uh, disassembled app, I saw this CBUUID data stream char UUID. So that immediately told me that 979 was probably the data stream, and then later in the code, 989 was the control UUID. This is a generally pretty useful technique for understanding BLE devices. Cloning the device is, is interesting. It turns out that BLE devices are pretty much role flexible. You're used to thinking of your phone as a BLE master and then your BLE device as a BLE slave, but it's not actually a requirement. In fact, every BLE device is pretty much capable of being either role. So the technique you use here is you connect to the device using GAT tool, get a list of all its characteristics, build a GAT server on Blues, making your laptop or your, your uh, attack platform mimic the device itself, and then you wait for the app, you, you trick the app into connecting to your laptop instead of the device. Then you can record the data that gets sent to it and uh, try to understand it then. This is really, really useful. I've used this to find uh, hidden debug uh, commands on devices where you can like turn on and off lights and uh, turn on vibrating motors, give them dirty names, stuff like that. This kind of is annoying right now because there's no way to automatically do this. You have to manually write some C code and uh, have it you know, send back the data and that sort of thing. Light Blue has a mode that does this automatically uh, and it's pretty nice. Um, I think a vert something the Blues guys were talking about maybe adding something like this in the future. So that would really automate this process. So that's pretty much how you talk to a device at the application level. And I can't really offer you much more information than that because everything varies from device to device. Like certain devices have simple characteristics that you can just talk to and read, like a heart rate monitor. Other devices, say like a Fitbit Flex, are going to have their own protocol that just uses GAT as a transport and has encryption and that sort of thing. At which point, you have to disassemble the app to understand exactly what's going on. So let's look at the BLE stack from a different perspective. Let's look at it, how it's actually implemented in practice. Again, you've got the link layer and the file layer on bottom. These are implemented in hardware. A BLE chip ha uh, processes the file layer and processes the link layer and hands the rest off to software running on the host. And in this case, when I say host, I'm not just talking about your smartphone or your laptop, but even a simple peripheral device like this is a BLE host. It has software running on it that implements the BLE stack. And these upper layers, L2CAP, AT, and GAT, are just binary protocols that run on top of this lower layer. And they're actually pretty ugly binary protocols. I've highlighted all the length fields and the nested length fields in this, and it's a little bit messy. Um, the top one is an advertising packet, and the bottom one is just a generic data packet. Whenever I see a protocol like this that I know is being parsed by some software written in C, I pretty much immediately want to build a fuzzer for it. So, because of the way Bluetooth is structured, with uh, part of it being implemented in hardware, part of it being implemented in software, the SIG actually made a well-defined protocol called HCI-H4 for allows the software to communicate with the hardware. And the interesting thing about this is that the hardware doesn't really care what you send to it, as long as it's a valid HCI packet. You can send complete garbage data, and it will send that garbage data over the air. 
which is really, really cool. This means that we don't need any specialized hardware in order to fuzz Bluetooth. We can do it using regular dongles. So no hardware investment necessary. So we need a platform for fuzzing. I chose Linux because it's open source and it's easy to mess around with the Bluetooth stack. The two primary options are to write raw HCI, talk directly to the Bluetooth chip, cut out the middleman, and generate all the packets that you want to send. This is really flexible. It allows you to build uh, completely custom packets. The other alternative is to take the Linux Bluetooth stack and modify it to send malformed data in one way or another. So in order to send raw HCI, it's a little bit tricky. You can't use the regular uh, protocol layers in Linux because uh, part of the stack is, written, is uh, handled in the kernel, part of the stack is in user space. It kind of gets in your way if you're trying to speak raw HCI. So uh, a few months ago, I was talking to Marcel Holtman, one of the Bluetooth maintainers, about this, and he said, oh, you want to speak raw HCI? Well, I'm working on something called HCI user socket. Let's do that. So that's pretty cool. And it's, you can think of it as kind of like sock raw, but for Bluetooth. It allows you to just speak raw HCI directly to the Bluetooth chip. And this actually just made it into Linux 3.13, which came out uh, in December or January. So using that, uh, and it's been in uh, development kernels for a while. So using that, I built a fuzzer around Scappy. Uh, Scappy, if you're not familiar, is super awesome. It's uh, normally used for doing things like constructing invalid IP packets or Ethernet packets or TCP packets, but it, it has some Bluetooth capabilities and I've significantly built those out. Um, so using this, I've been able to establish connections to BLE devices, do some basic communication, and some generative fuzzing using Scappy's built-in fuzz uh, method. The drawback of using Scappy is that you pretty much have to rebuild a lot of the Bluetooth stack yourself, and it's a pain in the butt. So my simple generative fuzzer is something like 100 lines of code just to bring up the Bluetooth device and, and establish connections. So I wouldn't call the Scappy stuff a dead end, but I didn't go very far with it because uh, it, was, it was just getting to be too much work to get anywhere. And I didn't actually find any volumes using the generative fuzzing inside fuzz, uh, using Scappy's fuzz. So if you're interested in playing with this, I haven't released the extensions to Scappy yet. I, I'm just polishing them up. I'm going to release those soon. Um, but uh, you can play with HCI user socket uh, in uh, Fedora 20, Arch, and Debian Unstable. They've got Linux 3.13 right now. And Ubuntu Trusty and Debian testing are getting those pretty soon. Kali uh, does not have it. And I tried to reach out to them to find out when they're going to include the newer kernel, and I got dead air, so I don't know. Whenever the next version's released, maybe. Pen2, uh, the live CD has an older kernel, but you can, if you install it onto disk, you can pull in a Linux 3.13 or even newer. So shifting gears, I went back and started looking at Blues. And this is really, really good code. Like Blues is, is probably the best Bluetooth stack I've looked at. So I decided to build a mutative fuzzer on this. There's probably a more intelligent way to do it, but I just kind of stumbled through the code until I found the part where they actually send attribute protocol requests over the air, and I just shoehorned in a little function to fuzz the PDU, the protocol data unit, before it gets sent. This is really naive, not very smart at all, wicked effective. <laughs> Tons of stuff falls out when you do this. I'm a believer in mutated fuzzers. And uh, by the way, I mentioned that GAT tool would come back. This is where we use it. We can just script up GAT tool to make tons of requests and have our fuzzing Linux blues sitting in the background, mutating packets and sending them out. So we've got our fuzzer, we've got our platform. Let's look at targets. You've got smartphones, Android running Blue Droid since Android 4.3. Um, iOS, they have their own stack. Windows Phone 8.1, it was just released, has BLE support, and BlackBerry 10 as well. A little bit more interesting are BLE devices. And oh, there are two primary BLE device vendors, TI and Nordic. They sell little Bluetooth chips that you can build your device around. This is a, sort of a generic BLE device. I've modeled it on a, a sensor, so imagine a temperature sensor. You've got a sensor, you might have some output, like a light or something like that, an LED. And then that's all connected to a BLE system on chip. That's the brains of the entire operation. 
the system on chip looks like this. It has a CPU core that's typically derived from an Intel 8051 or an ARM Cortex M0. That's connected to the BLE radio, and then there's flash for program storage. So the BLE radio handles the lowest two layers of the stack and then passes everything up to the CPU core. If you're a device vendor manufacturing devices based on, let's say, TI's chip, uh, TI will give you some proprietary tools for building software to run on their chip, and one of the things they'll give you is a, a binary Bluetooth library. It's just a blob, a, a library that you link against. So every TI chip out there pretty much, or every device built on a TI chip is running essentially the same BLE stack. And the same goes for Nordic. They're all running Nordic stack. So if you're able to find a vulnerability in these devices, you're able to potentially attack lots and lots and lots of devices, not just whichever one you found a vuln in, such as the power of attacking the stack. But I did some basic fuzzing of BLE devices, and it's really hard to fuzz them because it's hard to get meaningful feedback. You can't, you can't really tell when they've crashed. You connect to it, send some evil data. Maybe it crashed, maybe it just went away. It's hard to tell. This is some ongoing research that I'm working on with uh, some coworkers out of uh, one of ISEC's other offices. So I, instead, I turned my attention to BlueDroid, which runs on recent Android smartphones. It's an open source stack that was written by Broadcom that Google pulled in. If you look at the source, there are um, some things that make you nervous, like lots of calls to mempopy, and uh, who knows how well they check their bounce and stuff like that. And if you actually look at BlueDroid, how it runs on the phone, this is, uh, I ran PS on my Nexus 4, running Android 4.3, and you can see that it's running as a low rights user in user space named Bluetooth, but the Bluetooth, this, this user must have CapNet admin, which is really high level capability. Uh, this is what I pulled out of the capabilities man page. Um, you can perform, it says CapNet admin can perform various network related operations. Every one of these scares me. So if you're able to, you know, interface configuration, modify routing tables, bind to any address for transparent proxying, if you're able to get code execution in this context, it's not the same as getting a root level compromise or a kernel level compromise, but it's damn close. So our fuzz process, we script gap tool to send lots of data to our Nexus 4, this guy right here. We uh, use our modified blues that actually fuzzes the data we can log the actual packets that get sent over the air using BTMON, this is part of Blues, really great. Um, and then watching, we can just watch the output of ADB Logcat to see if it actually crashes. And then once we've identified an evil packet, we can tweak Blues to just send that packet straight off the bat. And uh, I'd like to give a little demo of one of the vulnerabilities I found. So, here I have a Bluetooth speaker. This is using classic Bluetooth, but all of the entire Bluetooth stack is implemented in the same process. So, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn on Bluetooth. Just make some noise in a second. Okay, it's connected. There we go. In this uh, virtual machine here, I want to turn that down. <laughs> um, in this virtual machine here, uh, I've got a modified blues that uh, actually runs. It, it, um, I identified a vuln using this modified blues, and then I identified a kiss of death packet that I can send to this device. And uh, it's actually very reliable, but give me one second. <laughs> Restart Bluetooth. Launch the heart rate monitor. Don't auto connect. Okay. So I reconnected to the speaker. So this is not uh, this is not how you would practically weaponize a bone like this, but this is I've, I've got it pretty reliably working here. So I'm going to go ahead and start some music. This is a... Uh... Uh, Mord Fustane is the official music of BLE, just so you know. Anyway, 
Uh, I'm going, I've got a BLE heart rate monitor application. I'm going to connect it to this laptop, which is running uh, a modified version of Blues that's imitating a heart rate monitor. So if you look in here, you can see the app just connected. The Bluetooth stack crashed. And on the screen it says, unfortunately, Bluetooth share has stopped. So I've remotely crashed the Bluetooth stack on this device. Thank you. So some details about how that actually works. Rest, rest my, my weird heart. I sacrificed a goat to the demo gods this morning. So uh, if you actually look at the output of uh, ADB logcat, you'll see this um, fortify source mem copy buffer overflow calling abort, and then a seg fault. I trace down the code that actually causes the seg fault. Um, this is uh, the blue droid on the phone is processing a GAT notification packet. This is one of the more exotic uh, operations that you can perform. Uh, and if you look, you'll see that stream to uint 16, it pulls a 16-bit value from the packet that you sent. But it doesn't do any bounds checking. It doesn't check to see if the packet is actually 16 bits long. So if you send a packet that is one byte long, it will pull out a 16-bit value, read past one byte past the end of the buffer, and then subtracts two from the length of the packet. One minus two as a 16-bit integer is 65,534. So it calls memcopy with a length value of 65,534. And that crashes the stack because Blue Droid is compiled with Fortify Source. Uh, it's a runtime check that has uh, some information from compile time. Uh, if the compiler knows how long the buffer that you're copying to is, it'll do a runtime check to make sure that it doesn't copy past the end of the buffer. So I demonstrated this attack because in case anybody around here is sitting there with an Ellis' sniffer, uh, they won't actually be able to weaponize it. As far as a timeline for this phone that goes, uh, I notified Google on September 30th, they committed a fix on October 7th, and then they tagged a new release of BlueDroid 4.4R.09 on October 30th. On October 31st, Android 4.4 was released, and then Google washed their hands of it. This is not fixed in Android 4.3, and if you remember Colin and John's talk on Wednesday, there's a slight problem with Google's ideal world where everybody's phone gets updates. They don't. So uh, if you check your phone to see if you're still running Android 4.3, you might be vulnerable to this and some other phones. Oh, one last thing before I start wrapping up. One of the things you can do is run BlueDroid on your PC. It's just C code, so why not give it a try? Uh, it turns out it's a pain in the butt because BlueDroid is not very well written, as you may have guessed from that vulnerability. Uh, it, took a, it took me a couple hours to put together some make files and hack the code so it builds on PC, but once I did so, I was able to single step through some packet parsing code and find a couple more vulnerabilities, so essentially source assisted penetration test. In theory, you could actually combine this with HCI user socket and run the entire BlueDroid stack on your laptop, uh, connect, talking to a Bluetooth chip, which would be pretty neat. And I've been talking to some people who are, I think, have done a lot of the work on that. And uh, at the bottom, I've got Blue dro uh, output of PS showing BlueDroid running on my laptop. Uh, the question for the ages, how do you pronounce blues? I asked Marcel Holtman, the blues maintainer, and he says, nobody knows. So blues, bluesy, and blues ed are all legitimate. Wanted to give some thanks first to Marcel for helping out a lot on this and for writing HCI user socket. Uh, the blues team for building the best Bluetooth stack hands down. Google for being really responsive when I uh, notified them of the vulnerability. And finally, of course, I'd like to thank CanSec West for giving me the opportunity to present here and ISEC Partners, my employer, for funding this research. And of course, thank you all for uh, coming to my talk. I have a few minutes for questions. There's one in the back there. Of course, I'm pointing at him while he's not facing me. How effective is turning off your Bluetooth in software? How effective is, is what? Turning off your Bluetooth in software, so like on my phone, I can disable it, but does that actually disable the chip? 
Uh, it it uh, it turn it sends a message to the chip that actually physically turns off the radio. So it's very effective for protecting yourself. And that reminds me, public service announcement. Turn off Bluetooth if you're not using it. If you are using it, make sure your device is not in discoverable mode. I was walking around earlier, and a lot of you are in discoverable mode. <laughs> Dave's laptop, I'm looking at you. you know, Anyone? Bueller. All right, thank you very much.